Now, next up, we have uh, we have the amazing Chris Barber, whose mission has been to uh, to give opportunity to kids and to adults alike with the leadership training that astronauts go through, with not as much of, of the cost. Hi, Chris. Good evening. Hello, Steve. Thanks for having us on. It is my pleasure. I am enjoying the fact that you are on. Uh, I've, as a kid, I've enjoyed wanting to travel to space. The fascination and the fantasy of, you know, walking in air as well, walking um, in nothingness technically. So, but I will let you take on because we are running slightly out of time. So, well, there's gonna there's gonna be myself and uh, Dr. Steve Swanson, who's an astronaut. A spacewalker who's been into that environment of nothingness and danger and been the commander of the International Space Station. So we can get started. We're going to run through a PowerPoint together. I'll take the first part and then I'll ask Steve some questions on the second part. Nice. Okay. Go ahead and share your screen, Chris. Sorry? Go ahead and share your screen. We don't see it yet. Oh, right. It's perfect. Have you got it? Have you got it? Yes. Great. Okay. So I've introduced us, and the uh, and there we are. There. The, the next thing is just to remind everybody that that the World Health Organization needs donations to help support the COVID nineteen, and you can go onto the Insider website and make donations. I'd urge you to do that, please. Uh, there's pictures of Steve and I when we didn't dye our hair quite so grey as we dye it now. Um, and we're going to take you through four main areas, the, uh, the future of the human space program, and then what it means to you, what, what advantages can you take out of that. Um, we're going to look at utilising space to develop your people and the contribution of space and the human space program to monitoring our fragile planet and its environment. Um, when I was asked to, to participate in this program, Steve asked me, why don't more nations participate in space? Um, well, it's, it's a funny old question because a lot of people say, well, it's expensive, but all that money is spent right here on Earth on research, development, innovation, technology, jobs. Um, and if you dig around on the, uh, the, the the World Space Agency site, you'll see that there's a return on investment. On them, it varies from between 7 and 17 to 1 on a, any pound, yen, dollar spent by a government. So why don't they invest? In my view, it's because... A prime minister or a president invests their pound or dollar now, and some other prime minister or president gets the return. So that's a that's a real disadvantage for people in power, I think. Um, what does it mean for you, the fact that not that many, that space is not taken up by lots and lots of people? Well, it actually means, as far as I can see, opportunity. Um, one great opportunity, and we uh, we carry out experiments on the space station, we've carried out just under 40, is that it gives an opportunity for you to signal your belief in your product. If you choose to test it out in space, the forefront of human experience, honestly, you must believe in your product. You'll also, in that strange environment where there's no convection, where there's uniform density, you'll get new insights into, into your products and what they're capable of. Um, we've tested all sorts from the, the little Daphnia that you can see there that have uh, DNA, which is more complex than humans, right through to addressing one of the great fears here on Earth, which is antibiotics. People are very concerned that, that bacteria develops resistance to antibiotics. Antibiotics are tougher and more virulent in space. So you can test antibiotics as we have to check whether when on tougher 
bacteria than we have on Earth weather their work. And to date, all of our experiments have proved successful. So there is good news. You can also take advantage of the investment NASA makes in its personnel to develop your teams. Uh, somebody at the very, very top of NASA told me when I asked, how much does it cost to train an astronaut? He said, costs round about $140 million. And it's possible that you can take advantage of that. You, why do you need to spend so much money? Well, and we're going to meet somebody any minute now who, is, who fits the bill. You're training people to become a part of a very small team to maintain, manage, and even repair the International Space Station in the most hazardous environments known to man. It's the, and it's such a responsibility. It's a, it's a construction of $150 billion and the most expensive thing that we've ever constructed as human beings. So I'm going to introduce now, you now to astronaut, Space Walker and Space Station Commander Steve Swanson. How are you, Steve? Hi, Chris. You? Yeah, I'm just fine. You know, we've got standard British weather here. It's nice and wet. <laughs> well, it's nice here in Boise, Idaho. So we're we're fine too. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about the International Space Station? Sure. If you look at this picture right here, you'll see that it is quite of a large piece of equipment. It is over 110 meters across, about 80 meters long. And just to know where it is, it orbits Earth about 400 kilometers above Earth, going about 20,000 kilometers an hour. That gets it in orbit. So we go around the Earth every 90 minutes. And it weighs over 420,000 kilograms. So it's actually a huge piece of equipment. It has the internal volume of a large house or like a 747 uh, aircraft. So it's quite amazing. If you look at then all the components, you go to the next one, Chris. And you say there's over 35 different components that, that was, were part of this space station, and they were all put together separately in space. There was uh, 37 shuttle missions, like five Russian missions, to bring pieces up and attach them. And the B, the biggest thing about all this was there was never attached on Earth prior. It was attached for the first time in space which is just a fact, engineering uh, feat that is just amazing to me. But it, it shows you that people have been on this thing since the year 2000. And, you know, uh, that is just a great human achievement that we now have people living in space continuously uh, for, you know, almost 20 years. And so I think that's when a really you, When you assemble the space station, you know, what sort of velocity are you traveling at as you orbit the Earth? Yeah, 28,000 kilometers per hour. So it's pretty, pretty fast. However, you know, our relative velocity is not very fast between the, the different vehicles, but it's still, you can go around, it's, it's definitely very noticeable. And that's what gives you the feeling, though, of not having gravity. Because technically, there is gravity in low Earth orbit, but we are going so fast around Earth, we are always in a free fall, which then gives us the environment of no gravity. So talk of being in an environment of no gravity, do you want to take us through a little bit about What's it like to be in space? Sure, yeah. First, of course, you have to launch to get into space. And here's a shuttle launch. I did two of these. And all my missions were to the International Space Station. So the first two shuttle ones were to bring up pieces and build a space station. And it's amazing launch being on the shuttle. And then from that, I went and did a, we call it long duration, which is six months stay on board the space station. And on that, I went up on a Soyuz rocket, which launches out of Kazakhstan. And here it is. So this is a Russian rocket. It's much smaller. And the idea is just to bring people up while the shuttle could bring up a bunch of cargo along with uh, the people. And so both of these then uh, take about nine minutes to go from zero miles an hour to the 20 or sorry, uh, zero kilometers per hour to 20,000 kilometers per hour. So it's really, really quick. But once you get up there, you'll see here that the big difference in this environment is the fact that we don't feel gravity up there. We are floating. It gives us the ability to do all sorts of things that we couldn't do here on Earth. Like, I am not a good gymnast at all, but I can sit around and do flips all day long in this environment. And that's what kind of makes the science so interesting, because once you take out the aspect of gravity, you can learn so much more about the secondary and tertiary aspects of properties of different things. So you watch this water right here, you can see that it sticks to his face. 
and it doesn't fall off because there's no gravity. And you can see then the adhesion cohesion of these water molecules. In fire, we, we test that too. And you can see that it floats in a ball in space and then the airflow around it makes it move around. So that's totally different uh, than you would have on the ground. We do many experiments on the human body. Uh, we found out the human body changes dramatically in space. And it's kind of like aging very, very quickly. And so if we can mitigate those steps, we can help everybody here on Earth, too. That's definitely one of the things we're learning how to do. Uh, growing uh, plants in space, uh, that's something we're going to have to do for future missions, and it helps to get people back on Earth. But just again, it's the whole idea of this environment of no gravity. Can, we can learn so much more about a process or about something else. Uh, Steve, I mean, you do, you do a stack of training, like you, you train for for years before uh, you be, get into space and you train um, for probably a year or more for each individual mission. Um, how much teamwork do you rely on for your missions in space? Uh, we rely on that tremendously. And not even just the crew, everybody at NASA, the people in mission control, the managers, engineers, we all go through training, some aspect of this training, because we believe it is so important to be a good team member. When we have had two space shuttle accidents in NASA, and both of them, a uh, partial cause was the fact that people weren't being good team members. They weren't listening to other people. They already thought they knew everything, and it just did not work out well. So we now stress this tremendously. And one of the things I like to you think know, is, is I learned many things from this whole training. And one of them, though, I like to carry with me all the time is the fact that I try to be good at objective self-evaluation. Because after every training simulation or whatever we did, we would do a debrief. And in that debrief, you first have to talk about, oh, well, how, what do you think it, how it went, right? And so you talk about what you did right, what you did wrong and all that, but you have all the other people in the group who also add to that and help you realize what you did right and what you did wrong. And you have to learn to be, I guess, open to this criticism and not be defensive about it. And once you get past that, that aspect, you can learn so much more, you can improve so much, and you can become a much better person. But it takes a little bit, as, as humans, we're not really geared towards criticism as well, but you have to get over that aspect. And then once you can do that, it can really help your uh, ability in so many different areas. How much do you focus on helping each other in the teams and also helping the leaders become better at being leaders? Uh, yeah, that's definitely a, a big part of what we do for training. And that's what sometimes we'll go actually do survival training, right? And so if you look at that, and what we do for here is you they put us into a harsh environment, and then they still want you to, of course, communicate really well. They want you to support your teammates, even though you might be struggling a little bit. And, and also the big thing is followership, which is, again, you talk about supporting your leader. And that's, uh, you know, being able to keep the big picture, figure out maybe they're missing some sort of information that you can give them. You can help them in their decision making process. Uh, it can all sort of things, but we have to work as a team to get through this. And that's what we do in these training uh, scenarios. So we'll spend days out either in the winter here or in a desert environment or someplace that's harsh. Right. And we will uh, just work as a team to try to be to communicate better, to help each other better, and to get better ourselves at just being a competent team member. But in your training, as well as training within your teams, uh, you must do a lot of training up uh, to how your team liaises and communicates with other teams, because your team is interdependent with a vast range of other teams, particularly if something goes wrong. That is true. And so you definitely work on the communication, especially you're not going to be able to talk to these people directly face to face. So it's all just kind of voice communication and you have to be clear and concise and and, and come across again, uh, not excited because you have to be very calm so you can get your message across quickly. And so we work on this in all these scenarios. And that's again, also we uh, fly airplanes just for that, because when you're in an airplane, that's a great analog for uh, being in a situation where you have to communicate with people in an environment that can be hazardous if something goes wrong. So earlier on, I talked about products. And of course, NASA is famous for coming up with a, a whole range of product, products. Do you want to tell us about it? There, there, there's you actually in a different outdoor environment. Do you want to say anything right, right. Oh, no. that's just another one, again, to learn more about uh, being a good team member and communication and helping your leaders like that. 
I mean, you can talk about, though, the new products. I think NASA comes up with a lot of good technology. And it's really not, you know, it's NASA and all the people, contractors, everybody in this whole big space exploration uh, community. And so to me, I, I had a couple of examples I was like is the Apollo computer. Because uh, at the time when Apollo went up, uh, computers were huge, right? And uh, they couldn't have a huge computer on Apollo uh, capsule because it was very small. So they had to shrink down the size of the computer. And that's when we first started the whole idea of making our computers very small. And now we have laptops and phones and all that. But it all started with the Apollo mission. And then another thing I like is I have cordless drills at home in my garage is the first cordless tool was developed by NASA for spacewalking. It is a cordless drill and we use that uh, when we do spacewalks, but that's where that whole idea and concept came from. And another thing that what I like about not only does NASA invent these new technologies, but then companies will take this technology and develop uh, new, the products for everybody here on earth. So everybody gets to use them here. And so that helps tremendously on this return of investment. So do people get hold of you now regarding um, possible product development and new business opportunities, Steve? Yeah, and NASA sends me like an email like once a week on all the new tech they have and uh, possibilities you can use them for and stuff like that. And they're looking for people to develop this. And so that's a, one of our jobs as kind of astronauts is to help that process. They call it uh, technology transfer. And we are trying to help out do that and get their technology out in the world because it is very important for them, they think, to, to help and share this with the world. So it's all about getting things out in the world. Uh, you've been involved in NASA does quite a bit of work on and monitoring our environment here. Yes, it does. And that's one of the main uh, purposes of NASA actually is Earth sciences and Earth observation. And if you look at this picture that you put up, that is actually ground O2, or sorry, ground ozone, O3, uh, on Earth. Uh, and so they've taken this, the data from different satellites and they've combined it to give you this picture. So you can actually see real time the ozone on the ground and you can see then where people are really using fossil fuels and what this gives you, right? And it gives you, of course, if you look at these different areas, it's very obvious uh, where they're being used. And it can, then it can help predict uh, where things are gonna happen with the ozone. Uh, different, many different models. They can, and they measure many different other particulates in the air too. And so we can monitor all the qualities of air around the world. And it helps, I think, our policymakers with this data. They can come up with good decisions uh, how we can improve the, you know, climate here on Earth and keep our Earth safe. So the light on on this particular diagram, the uh, the, the the brighter the spots on Earth, that's the worse the pollution is, effectively. Yes, it is. It's a good good way of now that I'm saying it. So it's yeah. shining a light on the pollution. Yes, it is. <laughs> okay, so we're going to move on and just have a look at your views on the future of human space exploration, okay? Yeah, because I think, again, we talk about the human space exploration, and again, uh, you know, this, they say the space station was $150 billion. Now we're talking into the trillion dollars for this future. So there is so much money that is going to be spent in this area and new technology is going to be developed. There's a lot of opportunity here. The first thing we're going to do is have a call it Lunar Gateway, which really is a, another space station uh, in orbit around the moon. And the idea here is the astronauts can go there, they can do science there, and then they can also do quick trips to the moon and back. And that's the first thing that's going to happen. The second step is going to be a moon base where we actually can have people that stayed on the moon, even though the gateway will still be going around the moon. And then people will start living on the moon and we can then learn uh, how to live on another planetoid and develop the equipment that can be reliable on this planetoid. Because it's a totally different, you know, the dust and everything, it's very, very different. It could be very hazardous to humans if things don't go well. And then because the final goal is to go to Mars. And but also this is that on the moon, Steve, isn't, it, isn't the dust on the moon full of a whole range of minerals that could be useful for life on the moon or even useful for us down here? That is true. And that's one of the things we would do is also learn how to extract different minerals, either for use for space travel, because there's water, we can get hydrogen and oxygen for fuel, for you know drinking, whatever we want. Uh, we can do that. And plus there are other minerals that could be very uh uh, abundant up there which is very rare on earth and we could use those for many products down here on earth so that's definitely one of the things we're looking at right steve we're into our last minute for somewhere you'd love to go to 
Yeah, and this is Mars, and because this is a huge trip to Mars, it's going to be almost a three-year mission again, and we have to have everything working really, really well before we head off to Mars. And again, I'm talking about there's going to be a lot of technology developed. It's going to be an uh, opportunity for many people to help with this and to use this technology out in the world once it's been developed. Well, thank you, Steve. Um, so that's it. I don't suppose we've got more than about 15 seconds for questions there, Steve. I know if I open the floodgates of questions that everyone everyone wants to ask, especially both of you, on everything from, you know, do you believe in the sci-fi or do you not watch sci-fi movies at all because of, you know, the reality that you've actually lived through of space walks to space travel? Well, I love sci-fi. However, I do have trouble with some of the movies, uh, say Gravity for one. Uh, it is so unrealistic and I could not get through that, right? Uh, and so that was very difficult. But the ones that are even more farther away in the future, maybe, uh, that they can get away when playing around with different things uh, that you, you don't use right now. So that makes it much easier to, to watch. But I do love sci-fi. Yeah, but in gravity, she hadn't actually left the planet. She'd just driven off the bridge. That was all a dream while she struggled to save herself and come out of the river. What about Mars? What about the Martian? Oh, the Martian? Um, it has some good aspects to it, but there still are uh, quite a few issues with their physics in that movie. And so that is very difficult sometimes to watch. I mean, me, the one of the simplest things they could do to make it better is on a hatch on a vehicle. You have it so that uh, when you close it, you close it with a seal uh, that will then push it out when you reduce the pressure on one side. But if you have the door that opens to the pressure side, it would never seal. They always have it wrong. And it's like, oh, come on. It's an easy fix to make. Right. But, uh, you know, it just, it's not it's something to think about. Hollywood will be snapping you up after this chat. <laughs> all the producers watching this. Yes, exactly. For all the producers watching this right now or the recording of this, whenever it is in the future, this, that is uh, astronaut Steve Swanson. You should reach out to him. That is the lovely director from ISET, Chris Barber. Both are amazing, amazing uh, talent, skills, leaders in their own rights, and I do. I uh, want to thank them from the bottom of my heart for, do, uh, for joining our event, for joining Reshape. So, hashtag Reshape. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dave. Bye-bye for now. You too. Bye-bye.